Hi, greetings, it's me, Dr. Paul Gerhardt, and today I want to talk about a very important uh, thing to consider when you're thinking about being an effective leader, or even being an effective employee for that sake. You know, we all have ideas about what an effective leader looks like, but those ideas might actually be minimizing and marginalizing people's effectiveness, and that's really important to consider. How we treat people or what we believe about people affects how we, we interact with them, which affects other people. And very often, we don't know that we may be limiting people's success and therefore our own team success by the way we treat other people. And so today, I want to talk about kind of a touchy topic on leadership, gender and leadership. And so uh, I'm digging deep into the research done by uh, the great Peter G. Nordhaus. And I want to talk about some things that he found in his research. I obviously have opinions on it. Maybe those opinions aren't so popular. But what I will tell you is right off the bat is I truly believe that women and men both can be effective leaders equally and we have to be aware of some of the the dynamics that surround uh, gender and leadership and able to be able to think through how we can make our organizations even stronger so stay tuned as we talk about gender and leadership so um, here are some of the things that we're going to talk about today women and the leadership perspective the glass ceiling uh, evidence of, of a leadership uh, labyrinth a, a understanding the labyrinth genders and uh, differences in leadership styles and effectiveness and then navigating uh, that labyrinth so gender leadership approach uh, really goes all the way back and I guess not very far but back into the 1970s you know researchers before that time ignored issues related to gender and leadership you know then scholars really started to be thinking about the phenomena can women lead and if you think about the movies that came out before the 1970s men were in leadership positions in every single industry and to this day we're starting to find a lot more balance except at the very top levels of fortune 500 companies and we're going to talk about that a little bit. So there have been uh, more and more effective leaders in both the corporations and political sectors. You know, some very effective female leaders um, come in from PepsiCo, for instance, and Avon and uh, General Ann Dunwoody. So there's a few examples. Uh, from a historical perspective, we really have to ask ourselves do men and women lead differently? Are men more effective leaders than women? You know, and, and why are women under, underrepresented in elite leadership positions? So it's important to take a look at things historically. Here's what we do know. These are facts, and uh, these come from studies uh, from the Catalyst done in, in 2014, or published in 2014. You know, currently, uh, women outnumber men in higher education. That's 57% uh, have bachelor's degrees. 60% have master's degrees. And more than 50% of all doctorate holders have doctorates that are women. So it really is important to take a look at the fact that more women have bachelor's degrees, more women have master's degrees, and and more than 50% have doctorates. Um, <clears throat> women make up almost half the United States labor force. Um, some studies show that it's about 46.8%, so just a little less than half. And women are still mm -hmm. underrepresented in upper echelons of America's corporations and political systems. We're going to talk about those numbers. So women occupy more than half of all management and professional positions and about a quarter of all CEO positions and this is according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics from 2013 
Um, women hold only about 14.4% of the highest titles in Fortune 500 companies, and they represent only about 4% of Fortune 500 CEOs, and that's according to Catalyst 2014. Um, women only hold about 16.9% of Fortune 500 board seats. Uh, women in politics, let's talk about that. Um, 99 of the 535 U.S. congressional seats, that's only 18.5%. Women hold about 20% of the U.S. Senate and 18.2% of the House of State Representatives. Women of color occupy just 30 seats, and that's from the Center of Women uh, and Politics from a 2014 study. And then the world average of women representation in national legislatures or parliaments is only 21.9%. The United States ranked 84th out of 189 countries, and that's according to the Interparliamentary Union from uh, 2014. High-ranking U.S. women military officers are only 6.9 percent. So there's a global phenomenon where women are disappropriately concentrated in lower levels and lower authority leadership positions than men, according to a 2003 study by Powell and Graves. And there are three types of explanations, and so let's talk about those. Human capital, uh, it's education, work experience, developmental opportunities, and work at the work at home conflict. Two, gender differences. This is the style of, and effectiveness, commitment and motivation, self-promotion, negotiation, and other various traits. And then there's this thing that I kind of introduced, and we call it prejudice. You know, there are gender stereotypes, biased perceptions and evaluations, vulnerability and uh, reactance, and then cross pressures. So um, all of these things make up what we call the leadership labyrinth. And it really is important to be able to be able to navigate by understanding what's happening. So let's talk about that leadership labyrinth. You know, human capital differences. There's a pipeline problem. Women have less education, training, and work experience than men, resulting in a dearth of qualified women. So, sometimes for some particular industries, women just don't have the right education and training. So, we talked about how women have more education, but getting the right training and experience to, to make them qualified is important. Pipeline is not empty but leaking. The explanation that women haven't been in managerial positions long enough for a natural career progression to occur. And so, um, it's something to consider. And then there's the division of labor. Uh, this is the explanation that women uh, self-select out of leadership tracks by choosing what's called the mommy track positions that do not funnel into leadership positions and so um, really is important to understand these things. Women do have somewhat less work experience and continuity than men largely due to disappropriate uh, dis uh, proportionate responsibilities, women for child rearing and domestic uh, uh, responsibilities. So women generally are staying home and taking care of the kids where men have traditionally and still continually to traditionally um, be the breadwinner. Uh, respond to work home conflicts by not marrying, not having children, or becoming super women, taking leaves of absences and working part time. And women who use flex time and workplace leave are often marginalized, taking time off from a career which makes uh, re-entry a little bit difficult. So <clears throat> you have to understand that. Women occupy more than half of all management and professional positions, according to Catalyst 2014, but have fewer developmental opportunities. Fewer responsibilities in the same jobs as men are less likely to receive encouragement, be included in key networks, and receive formal job training than their male counterparts. Confront greater uh, 
barriers to establishing informal mentor relationships and are more likely to be put in precarious leadership situations associated with greater risk and criticism. So um, gender differences in leadership styles and effectiveness, contrary to stereotypical expectations, women leaders aren't less task oriented and more interpersonal than men leaders. Women do lead in a more participative manner than men and an adaptive style because women are devalued when they lead in a masculine manner. They op occupy a typically masculine role or when evaluators are men. So they always have to face these things. As transformational leaders, women's styles tend to be more transformational than men's. Even as transformational leaders, they are valued less than men, and women engage in more contingent behaviors uh, and in, than men. Effectiveness of male and female leaders. Men and women equally are effective overall. Men and women are more effective in roles congruent with their gender, and women are less effective than men when role is masculinized like the military, when supervising large numbers of men or when rated by men, and somewhat more effective in education, government, social service, sustainability, uh, more effective in middle management. So uh, let's talk about commitment to employment and motivation to lead. Men and women show the same level of identification and commitment to paid roles. Men and women both view roles as workers as secondary to partner and parent roles. Women are less likely to promote themselves for leadership positions and women are less likely to emerge as group leaders, more likely to serve as social facilitators and men are more likely to ask for what they want. Women are less likely to negotiate or self-promote and perceive more backlash when they do. Again, this is all based on uh, the recent leadership, leadership gender uh, research that um, scholars have been doing. Prejudice is a really important consideration. You know, there's a gender bias um, from stereotyped expectations. You know, women take care and men take charge. You know, stereotypes really uh, are are scientific phenomena. There are cognitive shortcuts that influence the way people process information regarding groups and members. And sometimes there's truths to them and sometimes they're not, but you can never put a blanket, generally speaking, shouldn't put a blanket statement on any group of people because they affect people. Gender stereotypes include beliefs about the attributes of men and women and prescribe how men and women ought to be. You know, one of the most famous books, uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. You know, lots of stereotypes being put into, you know, that kind of philosophy. And, and then stereotypes are perpetuated all the time by uh, people publishing their ideas, you know, without well-documented evidence. So gender, gender stereotypes are pervasive and well-documented. And... Um, it's hard to change perspectives when there's there's so many of them out there. Men are stereotyped as uh, agentic characteristics, confidence, assertiveness, independence, rationality, and decisiveness. Women are stereotyped as communal characteristics, concern for others, sensitivity, warmth, helpfulness, and uh, nurturing. So. Um, these are things that continue to, to emerge in the scholarly literature. Um, really being able to understand the labyrinth means that you have to recognize that general, gender stereotypes explain um, numerous findings. You know, women are facing cross pressures to be tough but not too manly. Uh, greater difficulty for women to be valued as effective in top leadership roles. Uh, penalty for women who violate gender stereotypes, you know, we, we, we see things uh, all the time in the news, for example, you know, Hillary Clinton most recently, you know, expected to be a certain way because she's a, a female, but when she does characteristics that are like a man, uh, people look down on that. 
Uh, decision makers influenced by homosocial reproduction, a tendency for a group to reproduce itself in its own image, you know, and so if there's a, a man that's the top CEO, he might want to find someone that looks like him or acts like him to be his successor. So being able to understand, you know, how stereotypes affect women is really important, you know. Pressure of tokenism and being scrutinized have, have a role in this. Women may assimilate to a particular stereotype or may counter uh, the stereotype and it really depends on each individual, you know, their self-efficacy, um, being aware of, of the stereotype and recognizing what the task is involved, um, recognizing the power and whether or not um, stereotype threats are, are combined. So if a leader wants to be effective, um, the individual must be effective in negotiations and use effective leadership styles. Um, they uh, need to have good interpersonal skills and be aware of decreasing gender stereotypes. At the organizational level, um, leadership must be diversified and there must be equity in paternity and maternity leaves. And societal, you know, uh, gender equity in domestic responsibilities must be acknowledged and so each of these different factors are really important to consider. So um, culture is always changing. Uh, gender assumptions are, are now being challenged more often. Organizations um, valuing uh, flexibility and diversity at the top uh, levels of organizations, developing effective and supportive mentoring relationships, you know, helping people get a hand up and, and helping them develop the skills that are needed to be effective. Um, so uh, negotiating for valued positions and resources needs to take place. Uh, factors contributing to leadership effectiveness and rise of female leaders. Um, many women are getting into being entrepreneurs, starting their own businesses. They're improving their perception of their leadership ability by combining communal and agentic qualities. They're adopting transformational leadership styles and becoming more assertive without losing their femininity. So it really is important to understand the many dynamics of gender in leadership positions. We all have to understand our own biases. We need to understand the different obstacles that are standing in front of people and, and have um, clear tactics in order to be able to um, address prejudice and create more awareness. You know, using helping people gain effective negotiation skills and be able to enhance their leadership ability is important. And then culture within the organization is really important. Mentoring needs to take place, um, opportunities for women to be put into strategic positions and having uh, women seen in prominent leadership positions. All of these things can help equalize um, organization strengths by being able to draw on each leader's natural resources. Okay, I've given you a lot to think of and this information is all based on the, the most recent literature on gender and leadership and so there's a lot to consider. We all can affect people's effectiveness and, and so how we treat others affects uh, our relationships and, and our, our beliefs. So have an open mind about uh, what it is that you believe and, and recognize that we can help each other become more effective leaders if we, we, we're we aware of our biases and we act in a way that helps make a positive difference without judgment. Thank you so much for your valuable time. I really appreciate it. I hope that you have a great day because only you get to choose how you feel about it. I'm Dr. Paul